up with a psalm so if you want to read along it's psalms 145 i'm starting at verse one it says i will exalt you my god the king i will praise your name forever and ever every day i will praise you and extol your name forever and ever great is the lord and most worthy of praise his greatness no one can fathom one generation commends your works to another they tell of your mighty acts they speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. Amen. Are you ready to meditate on his works this morning? We serve a mighty God. Amen. Let's give him praise. Lord God, I just pray that you anoint this service this morning, God. Let us focus on you this morning, God. Let us forget about our cares, God, about the things of this past week that have come against us, Lord God. God, I pray that there's peace in this place. God, I pray peace, God, this morning. Whoever needs it, God, Thank calm you, our minds, calm our spirits this morning, God. Let us reach out to you, Lord, with all of our hearts, God. Let us worship you this morning with all of our souls. In Jesus' name, amen. You ready to praise him? Come on and give him a hand clap of praise. He's worth Trust in you. I put my trust in you. 
One more time. I put my trust in you. 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 Come on, lift up a shout. Come on, if your faith is in him this morning, lift up a shout to the Lord. Hallelujah. worship you, Lord. You're worthy, God. Come on and just give him praise this morning. Yes, you're worthy, Lord. Hallelujah. Yes. We worship you, Lord. God, I pray that you lead us this morning, God. Guide our footsteps, Lord. God, we worship you, Lord. Come on, just give him praise this morning. You call me out upon the waters, the great unknown, where feet may fail. And there I find you in the mystery. Oceans deep, my faith will stand. So I will call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves. When oceans rise, my soul. Bound to deepest waters, your sovereign hand will be my guide. Where feet may fail and fear surrounds me, come on, sing it. You've never failed, and you won't start now. Come on, declare it this morning.
we're glad that he calls you his child this morning. Come on and give him some praise. Yes, you're worthy, Lord. <laughs> Just worship the Lord. Close your eyes and worship him now. Jealous for me again. Come on, sing it. He is jealous for me. Love's like a hurricane. I am a tree. And in me, the weight of his wind embers. When all of a sudden I am unaware. to him.
Let's make it personal. He loves me. Oh, how he loves me so. Oh, how he loves me. How he loves me so.
We worship you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you. Worthy is your name, O oh God. Somebody say, praise the, praise the Lord. Somebody say, God is good. God is good. Amen. 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 You need your Bible. I need my Bible. Well, I'm 58. Rhonda, Rhonda found uh, one of my, uh, not mine, but it was, the, it was the same model of Bible that I had when I was first filled with the Spirit and called to preach when I was in college. And it was a tiny little slim line, and I opened it, and I said, ain't no way I can read that now. Uh, those, that print, that's like the fine print. When you order something off of Twitter and it comes from Japan and it's got this little, the instructions are like this big, you know, and it's like folded 20 times. Have y'all got anything like that? And then you open it and it's like, and then even with your glass, and then you got to use your phone and make a picture and then blow it up. Anybody? Life, life hack. All right. All right. Well, it happens. Yes, it does. All right. Let me test this and see if the battery still works. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. Just don't mind me. Just talk amongst yourselves. All right. Praise God. John, I probably need to get my notes here. Here we are. Boom. John chapter 10. Did you come to enjoy the Lord today? I hope you came to enjoy the Lord. I, I, did, I, I should shut up. In my life, I have been to churches that were a drudgery to go to. And, I, and, 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 and now, I always wonder, why do people go to churches that are a drudgery to go to? If you, go, if you don't go somewhere where you enjoy the presence of God, why are you going? If it's a misery, why are you going anyway? John chapter 10, 
I want to talk about one of the elements of the great thing about serving God today. Um, let's, look at, uh, let's look at the text, though. Verse 30 through 39. Be- beginning in verse 30, this is Jesus talking. He says, I and the Father are one. Again, his Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus said to them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? We are not stoning you for any good work, they replied, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I have said you are gods? If he if he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and Scripture cannot be set aside, what about the one whom the Father set apart as his very own and sent into the world. Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy because I said I am God's Son? Do not believe me unless I do the works of my Father. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. Again they tried to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. May the Lord add blessing to the reading of his word and you may be seated this morning um i want to preach this week and next week i want to preach on on a a topic uh it, it is a topic that i will be also exploring in the wednesday night uh uh at some point this year so uh please uh Please make the sacrifice of your time and come out on Wednesday night. And uh, we got some great things planned that we're going to talk about and we're going to cover in depth. But I can only touch on them in a message. But on Wednesday nights, I will be going much deeper into these issues. But I want to preach on the subject, the power of intimacy. And today's subject is perfect intimacy. And next week, will also be the power of intimacy, but it'll be a different subject. Uh, Perfect intimacy. Uh, I don't even know how today's going to turn out, to be honest. Um, Christy thinks that's hilarious, or if something else is hilarious, I don't know. Uh, But to be honest, uh, but what I know is I have to preach this because the things that I'm going to preach next week, you, you won't fully understand them unless I talk about this. And if I, if I tried to do next week without talking about this, I would have to preach a lot of this, and then it would be an hour and a half sermon, and who wants that? I, I need my crickets. When I, you know I'm a fourth grade teacher now, so I have, like a, whole, I have a whole list of, of sound things that I use. Like uh, when the kids say something not fair, something isn't fair. I have the sad violin that I play, and uh, yeah. So yesterday a kid needed to interrupt class for something and, and go to their cubby. So I have elevator music, and I say, "Just go ahead, we'll wait." And I just play the elevator music while they're. It's it's a it's a lot of fun. Anyway, I have that too. So I need to preach this, but I don't really know how it's going to go. But God always He shows up. So I know God knows what he's doing. So let's talk about perfect intimacy. What is perfect intimacy? Well, let's first, in order to understand perfect intimacy, let's first go back to the book of Genesis, shall we? You don't have to turn. Genesis 2, verse 7. God breathed into Adam... And he became a living soul. God breathed into Adam and he became a living soul. Were there any animals that God breathed into? I'm going to stay off that dangerous ground. One time I preached something or I said something in a message uh, around that subject and I got myself in big trouble so I won't even touch that but just suffice it to say that when God breathed into Adam he became a living eternal soul <clears throat> Adam had the breath of life in him he had spirit soul and body and uh, so he is now eternal 
Because God breathed into him. The question is, why did God create us? Do you ever, did you ever wonder that? Why did God create us? He created us to have intimacy with him. He created us to know him as he knows us. He created us to choose him. He created us so that we would know him above all the other creation and so that in obeying him, we would spend eternity with him, glorifying him. He created us for his glory. <clears throat> but in, but, but the, the process of knowing God and being known by God, that is what I call intimacy. It is, it is the deep personal relationship between two persons. And we have intimacy between God and us. We can have intimacy in human relationships where you uh, are known and you know the other person. Amen? Is it going to be this quiet all day? Uh, I don't know. I'll have to figure it out. But this is why God created. He created us to have intimacy with him. Our souls are created to be connected to God. Our souls are created to be connected to God. So, when our souls are not connected to God, anybody remember when you were in the world? When your soul is not connected to God, it cries out for that connection. And it seeks a replacement if it can't find the genuine. Now's, now's when you can say, amen, pastor, you, you got it. Because <clears throat> I spent 10 years in the world, and I can tell you, I knew God and I walked away from God. And I spent that time trying to find something to fill me because God wasn't there. So, if, you are, if your soul is not connected to God, it will cry out for a replacement. And Satan provides many counterfeits for what God gives. <clears throat> the best I've ever felt the best I have ever felt in this life is when I've been in a, in, come on now, some of you that's been there, you're gonna, you're gonna, your hair is going to tingle because you're going to go back. But the best I have ever felt in my life is when I've been in a worship service where the Spirit of the Lord moved and you could almost feel an electric presence of the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> and pastor preached or he spoke in the pulpit the other week, and it took me back. Man, it took me back, and I'm going to mention it now. I hope I don't get bogged down. Rhonda said, you always get off your topic. <laughs> Whatever. She's not here. She may not even listen to this. If you listen to this, I'm sorry. I banked on you not listening to it, so sorry. But pastor said, pastor reminisced about when he was in Africa, and the people, do you remember, and they were singing, All I Need Is You? And he said the, the presence of the Holy Ghost was so strong, it was like electricity. Your, your, ha your hair on your arms would stand on end because you could feel the presence of God. Now, that's supposed to be a spirit thing, not a physical thing. But I'll, I'm here to tell you that when God moves, that line between the, spirit, the, the spiritual and the physical begins to get a little blurry. And I'm telling you, you can feel things in the physical when God is there. And you're like, well, I don't know about that. That's because you haven't been there. That's not this message. <laughs> but when he talked about that, it, it took me back to the night that I was filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and, and um, we, were, we, were at, we were at in college, and it was a, 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 it was a choir singing, and it was a black gospel choir. And I'll tell you, they had the Holy Ghost, man, when they sang. The Holy Ghost just moved through their singing. And they were singing, we are not ashamed. And I tell you, the Holy Ghost fell in that house. And I was like 30 rows back. And I could feel the electricity of the Holy Spirit. It felt like my whole body was on fire. 
And that connection is the best I've ever felt in my life. There's been no drug that's made me feel better. There's, there's been no massage that's made me feel better. There's, it, it, the best I've ever felt is when I felt that presence of the Holy Spirit. Anybody ever been there? And I, spent, I must have spent two hours after I was filled with the Spirit, two hours in the altar, maybe more, just praying and praising and crying. And when I left that place, it was 1 o'clock in the morning. And, and yes, it was 1 o'clock in the morning. I was young. It didn't matter. Who cares? 1 o'clock in the morning. I haven't seen 1 o'clock in the morning except, well, I'm going to shut up. Can't, can't say when. But uh, you can figure it out. I'm 58. Uh, it's like two or three trips a night. Um, but I left. It was 1 o'clock in the morning. I didn't care. It is the best I'd ever felt in my life. And I'm not saying that we seek God to get feelings. It's not about that. But I want you to know that that feeling, that connection, that feeling of being connected to God, that's why he created us. He created us to know that feeling and to know him as he knows us. And when we don't have that connection, when we don't have that in our soul, guess what? Our soul cries out to have that. And so Satan says, you know what? You don't have it. I'm going to give you all these different counterfeits to make you feel it. So if you don't feel God, you can take a pill. It'll make you feel something. In my case, I used to play poker. Loved it. Man, when I knew I had a great hand and I was going to crush the person on, 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 uh, across the table from me, I got a, a rush of adrenaline in my, in, my in my body. I could feel it. But that was Satan giving me a counterfeit to what God created to give me. Do you see? And when I came back to God, you know what I said? Never again will I go back to the fake because I know the real again. Now, in this message, I want to look at the, the biblical example of perfect intimacy. The perfect example of intimacy and what it means. What is the perfect example of intimacy? Has anybody figured it out? Jesus and the Father. Jesus and the Father are perfect intimacy. Now, you'd be like, well, yes, they were Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Of course they had perfect intimacy. They were the Trinity. Yes, but when Jesus came to earth, <clears throat> he gave up a lot of that, a lot of that, that he enjoyed with the Father, he gave that up because he became a man. I'll get into that. He didn't give up his divinity. Don't, don't misunderstand. Let's first look at John 10. Are you still there? In, in verse 30 of John 10, Jesus makes a bold statement. He says, I and the Father are one. As we, as we, as we are sure, obviously, that didn't go over well with the Pharisees. Why were the Pharisees upset? Because they, they knew that Jesus was claiming to be equal with God or claiming to be God. And so they picked up stones to stone him because, you know, that's blasphemy. But we need to understand that when we, when we look at scriptures like this, we have to realize that we look at it through a lens of understanding. We look at it through a lens of being 2,000 years later, and we have all of the history of the church where they figured out the Trinity, and, and it's been taught, and you grew up learning Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and all of, that thing, all of that is, you know, Rhonda may be over there right now teaching Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I don't know, but it's, it's drilled into us. But guess what? They didn't have that in that day. And when Jesus comes along and he says, I and the Father are one, the only thing they knew was what? There is only one God. His name is Jehovah. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. That's what they were drilled with, and that's what they had in their mind. And so when Jesus comes along and he says, I and the Father are one, they say, what? Pick up a rock. Let's kill this guy. So we need to cut them some slack. Yes, they're trying to kill Jesus, but we need to cut them some slack. They're responding from their mindset, which their mindset is there is one God. And we understand there is one God, but we also understand that he exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
So they picked up stones to stone him in verse 31. So Jesus issues a challenge in verse 32. What does he say? He says, why are you stoning me, right? Help me. I'm half blind. I, he says, uh, I, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? So what, 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 which one of the good works that I have done are you stoning me for? And they say, we're not stoning you for any good works. We're stoning you because you claim to be God. Everybody got it? Everybody understand it? So then he issues another challenge in verse 37 and 38. Look at it. He says, do not believe me unless I do the works of my Father. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. Now, this is a very powerful concept, and I don't, I don't know if you've ever really thought about it, and I haven't really thought about it until God put this message in my heart. It's a very powerful concept that Jesus is springing on the Pharisees and on us. If Jesus is claiming to be God, what are his credentials? Is basically what he's saying. He's saying, what are my credentials? Now, what is a credential? Well, this is my Prince George's County School credential. Steve used to have one, but he gave it up. He has a better, he has a better credential. Retired. I want that one too. This is my credential. Now, in my little plastic window, I don't show my picture because it's a terrible picture. I know that's vain. But what does a credential do, folks? In, in class, we have turn and talk, where you, you sit in a group of two or three, and I have, I have the students turn and discuss with their partner. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, what does a credential do? Somebody said access. Good answer. Good answer, Gene. Move your pin up. <laughs> we have a pin chart. If you do good, you move it up. If you do bad, you don't move it up. What does a credential do? A credential indicates authority. Another good answer. Any, any other good answers? Gives, somebody said it gives you access. It identifies you as a part of something bigger. When I worked at the State Department, I had a credential. It said United, U.S. Department of State. It had my picture on it. It said that I had the authority to go into the State Department building. And you had to show, and we called them creds. You had to show your credentials every time you went in. Why? Because a credential indicates that you are who you claim to be. Not only does a credential give you authority, and not only does a credential give you access, and not only does a credential indicate that you're a part of something bigger, but a credential indicates that you are who you claim to be. It is an organization or a body issuing a, a document that says this person is who they say they are. Here's my wallet. Got some other credentials. Uh, insurance card. This indicates I have insurance. Isn't it annoying when you go to the doctor and they've asked for your insurance card 50 times and then they want to see it again? Why do you, that's, uh, don't preach pet peeves when you preach. Oh, here's one of my favorite credentials, if I can find it. Here's one of my favorite credentials. My Massanutten owner card. Because when I use that, it means I'm on vacation. Hallelujah. Yeah. And that credential indicates that I am an owner. It, it, it's one thing to go in and say I'm an owner. 
and say, I want this privilege and this privilege and this privilege. But then they say, can I see what, Gene? Your owner card. Why? Because they want to know that I am who I say I am. Are you getting it? So Jesus says, what are my credentials? I'm claiming to be God. What are my credentials? What are his credentials? Look back at the text. Do not believe me unless I do the works of my Father. Boy, it's quiet. I need my, I need my crickets, uh, YouTube. This is hard. This is a powerful concept, but it's also hard for, uh, it's a little hard to grasp if you have a Protestant background, Pentecostal background, charismatic background. It's a little hard to grasp because we're all about grace, aren't we? We love grace. Grace, grace. You can only be saved by grace. You cannot be saved by works. It's all about grace. And I love grace. Without God's grace, I wouldn't be here. I deserve to be dead, but God gave me uh, nine more years of bonus time. I tell Ron, it's bonus time. I ain't worried about things. I'm on bonus. Hallelujah. Jesus gave me a bonus. Amen. If I got what I deserved, I'd be dead. But God, who is rich in mercy, Amen. showed his grace to me. And here I am. Grace. I love grace. Not preaching against grace at all. Grace is awesome. But Jesus says, what are my credentials? My credentials are the works that I do. He's saying, look at my works. Ooh, ooh. That's, a, that's a powerful concept. He's saying, look, it's one thing to hear what I say. But look what I do. Look what I do because my works are my credentials. He says, if I'm doing the works of the Father, then I must be who I say I am because my works are my credentials. If I, if, if, if I do the works of my Father... My claim to be one with the Father must be true. Now, you know, this they did not want to swallow that. No. But that's what he said. He said, look at my works. Now, we know what his works were, don't we? He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He set captives free. He cast out demons. Man, a demon never wanted to see him coming. Do did, did, did you ever notice in the scripture when Jesus comes across a demon possessed, they're always conflicted? It's like half of them wants to run and half of them wants to stay. You know why? Because the demon wanted to run. But the person who wanted to be free made sure to stay so that they could be free. My Lord, I feel him. And, and many of us may have been through that same struggle years ago where the devil was trying to make you run from God, but you stayed and you receive from God. Hallelujah. That's not in the notes. Now let's turn over to John chapter 5. John chapter 5, verse 17. On another day, on another day, now this was constant. It was like every day he got into it with the Pharisees. And, you know, everybody needs a hobby. Um, verse 19. Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his father doing. Okay, this is, his works. Things he does, right? Okay. The son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his father doing. Because whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Yes, and he will show him even greater works than these so that you will be amazed. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. 
What does he say? Verse 19, I can only do what I see the Father doing. <clears throat> now, this is a hard concept to understand. I thought, okay, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We all agree to that. So why then is Jesus saying, I can only do what I see the Father doing? If he's God, the Son, why does he need to be connected to the Father? This is where we get into the concept of the incarnation and the emptying of Jesus, which is in Philippians chapter 2. The things that Jesus did in the body, incarnation, you understand incarnation means God the Son became a man, Jesus. So once he became a man, Paul teaches in Philippians chapter 2, he emptied himself. He emptied himself. He did not stop being God. But he emptied himself of the prerogative. Uh, I was reading commentaries, and one, uh, some commentators say he gave up the rights that he had before he was incarnated, the rights of Trinity, even though he's, he remained God in the flesh. He took on flesh. But in taking on flesh, he no longer acts This is hard to say, and it's hard to say without it being misunderstood. <clears throat> because some teachers have said it and been misunderstood. And so they constantly are on YouTube correcting the record. I've seen that too. But when Jesus becomes a man, he is fully God. But look at, look at what happens to him, what we have recorded, before his baptism. Does he do any miracles? Does he part? Does he speak to this uh, to the storm and get rid of it? Does he do anything special? No. All the way up until he's baptized, what we read and what we see is he's just living a normal life. But yet he's God. He was God in the flesh from birth, even from conception. So he has emptied himself of something. And so when he does works in the flesh, he does those works through the power and anointing of the Holy Spirit that came on him at his baptism and remained, the scripture says. He does his works through the power and anointing of the Holy Spirit and through that connection with the Father. As a man, he had to stay connected to the Father to do the things that he did. Why? We know that, he, that at his baptism, which is in Luke chapter 4, the Bible says that the Father spoke and said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And the Spirit descended in the form of a dove and lit upon him and remained. We know that he went into the desert and was tempted for 40 days. And when he came out of the desert, the Scripture says Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. Right? So the things that he did, he did through the power of the Holy Spirit. And he did through that intimate connection with the Father. So he was good to go. Once he came out of the desert, he was good, right? He could do whatever he wanted. He could do any miracle. He could... Are you with me? Yes or no? No. He constantly prayed, didn't he? He constantly cultivated 
intimacy with the Father during His public ministry. Why? Think about it. If He is God already, why does He have to pray? If He is, if he is God and already has anointing, why does he have to pray and cultivate that intimacy with the Father? <clears throat> have you ever thought about that? Maybe you've never thought about it. Maybe I'm blowing your mind this morning. No, no it's not really a class. I just want you to think. I just want, but you can talk about you can talk to me about it after church. Why does he pray if he's God? In, if he's God the Son, why does he pray? Hmm. <laughs> is everybody thinking about it? Jesus is the eternal Son of God. We start there, right? Eternal Son of God. That means he was, he was God at the beginning. He's God when he's, when he's incarnated. He's God in the flesh. He's God when he dies on the cross. He's God in the grave. He's God when he rises. He's God now. And he's God when he comes back in the rapture, right? Eternal. So, I am, in no way am I saying he was ever less than God. But when he became a man, he emptied himself. Paul talks about that in Philippians chapter 5. And he took the nature of a servant. Why did he do that? It's because God had to become man in order for us to be able to reach up and touch God. The only way for us, once Adam and Eve blew it. You see, Adam and Eve, go back to them. Perfect intimacy with God in the garden, right? They walked, with, they walked with God in the cool of the day, right? Right? They had perfect intimacy with God in the garden. The Bible says they were naked and not ashamed. Why? Because when you have nothing to hide, you don't have to hide anything. They walked naked and they didn't know they were naked. They didn't know they, had, they didn't have sin, so they didn't care. They walked and they knew God and God knew them. It was perfect intimacy. But then they sinned and what happened to that intimacy? As soon as they sinned, what did they do? They hid. You see it? As soon as they sinned, they hid. And they were separated from God. Because they lost that intimacy. And, and from that day until Jesus died on the cross, humans had been trying to find that same intimacy that they had in the garden. And some had it, but most didn't. But then when Jesus dies on the cross, he provides the way open for that intimacy for everyone that through faith, Paul lays it out in the books of Romans and Galatians, he says, through faith, you can have access into that intimacy, and it's not hard. All you have to do is repent and confess and believe in your heart, and you can come. And then on the day that Jesus died, the veil was torn from the top to the bottom as a sign that that intimacy was now restored, that what was taken away in the garden through Adam and Eve's sin was now restored through Jesus. And the only way he could do that is for God to become a man. So when God became a man, he had to empty himself. What did he empty himself of? Did he empty himself of his godness? No, he never stopped being God. But we know that we know from the Old Testament that no one could look at God. But everyone looked at Jesus. So we know he emptied himself of his visible glory, right? He was not he was not uh, the son as he existed before the incarnation. We know that he, that he was restored to his visible glory. How? Because when John saw him, he saw him in a, in a measure of his visible glory. And what happened to John, the man who lived three years with him and was his most intimate follower? He fell down like he was dead because he saw the real glorified Son of God. So we know that he emptied himself of some things. Here's the way I put it, and, and maybe it helps to, it, maybe it'll help you to think of it this way. He never ceased to be God, but he gave up that unfair advantage of divinity. What do, what do we mean? What do I mean by that? He, he came and became a man 
So now, as a man, he has to re he has to maintain that intimacy with the Father, so that he can do the things that the Father has sent him to do. Maybe if you look at it this way, am I not doing something right? Here we go. The Father, the Son, Jesus came to Earth. The Father and Jesus. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Jesus prayed. Jesus cultivated. Right? There was a connection. Right? Because of that, Jesus was able to do what? What do those arrows represent? Because of the power of the Spirit. That's miracles. Because, because of that connection to the Father, <sighs> miracles. Jesus did miracles. The works what we call miracles. So, what does that arrow represent? Connection. Intimacy. Because Jesus maintained intimacy with the Father, the Spirit of the Lord, and He remain sinless the spirit of the lord moved through him in anointing and power so that he could do the bible says how god anointed him to do good works god anointed him through the holy spirit to do the works that he was sent to do the miracles but we know he still got tired he still uh he still got weary he felt things come apart to a quiet place and rest The things that Jesus did in the flesh, he did through the anointing of the Holy Spirit and through intimacy with the Father. The question is why? Why did Jesus have to do it that way? Think about that for a minute. Thank you, Karen, my star student. Bring your paper up here. I'm going to put a gold star on it. He did it this way because he is showing us how to do it. Because if he had done these things as God, then we would not be able to do what he did. If the miracles that he did... He did because he was God, and he never emptied himself of that. Then we would never be able to, we would be, well, I can't do that. But he did it through intimacy with the Father and through prayer and through fasting and through uh, holiness and through obedience and all of those concepts that the New Testament teaches us. And then Jesus comes along in his teaching to the disciples, and he says, I'm showing you a pattern, and I'm doing good works. But what does he say? And I don't want to preach my message from next week, because see, I had to say all this, because next week is where I'm going to talk to you, and where I'm going to say now, because God had, because Jesus had perfect intimacy with the Father, and he did what he did. Now, Jesus says to you, now you go and do what I did and do even greater. Because what, I, I tried to do this late last night, and Lord, it, this was hard enough, believe me. This was like splitting the atom, okay? So please, clap, you know, give me, give me something. No. I wanted to put like Holy Spirit and you know anointing and put a and I'm like I ran out of time it's like 11 o'clock I gotta go to sleep and but we know that the Holy Spirit came on Jesus and anointed him to do the miracles that he did he did not do the miracles because and only in and of that he was 
God the Son. He did the miracles because the Holy Spirit worked through him to do those miracles. And we know that because the Spirit comes upon him in the form of a dove. And we know that when he comes out of the desert, it says the, the power of the Holy Spirit anointed him. to. Uh, he returned to uh, Galilee in the power of the Spirit, it says. So we know that he did what he did through the power of the Spirit. So guess what? Jesus says, I am going away. And when I go away, who am I going to send? The same Holy Spirit who has anointed me to do the works that I did now is going to anoint you and you're going to do the works that I did and you are going to do even greater works because I go to my Father. Woo! That's hope. That's joy. That's something to look... That's anticipation that's something to look forward to that's like man are you saying that I'm supposed to work miracles are you saying I'm supposed to raise the dead are you saying I'm supposed to heal blind eyes and open deaf ears and and uh, lift up the lame yes that's exactly what I'm saying but it ain't free. It ain't free. Guess what? Just because Jesus do, did all this doesn't mean it's free for you. In, in one sense, it is free. It's already been paid for. But in another sense, there's a cost. You gotta, the scripture says you got to count the cost. Let's stand. I don't even know how to do an altar call. I don't even know if we should do an altar call. But I had to say this. Because next week, I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to challenge you to go deeper. I'm going to challenge you to go further. I'm going to challenge you to go to a new place in God. Some people say, oh, well, I'm busy now. I'm not, I ain't got to, I got to mow my lawn. It's the first time of the year. Uh, I don't want to be challenged. I just want to sit and, and, and be made happy. No one's here to be made happy. Hallelujah. We're here to learn how to obey God. We're here to learn how to walk in the power of the Spirit. We're here to be an apostolic group of people that ministers in the last days and changes the world for Jesus. And age is just a number. It doesn't matter. News flash. Abraham was older than all of you when he got the promise. When he got the messianic promise, he was older than everyone here. Whew. I don't know how old brother Matt is, but Caleb, I think, was older than everyone here. Maybe, maybe not Sister Carol, I don't know. When... I, I, don't, I don't keep up, Sister Carol, but he was 85 when he went into the promised land. And my Lord, I love that man. I love that man. One of my favorite characters from the scripture. You know, pastor loves Gideon, Gideon house of God. If I start a new church, it might be Caleb house of God. Because he was 85 and he said he went to his, he went to his good friend, uh, Joshua, because they were the only two from the whole generation. Because remember, everybody else had died. He went to his good friend Joshua and said, give me the hardest hill. Give me the toughest enemies. Give my family, whew, give my family the toughest adversaries because the Lord is with me and we will drive them out. Do you know why Caleb would say that? Because he, God had told him 40 years earlier, every place you step your foot belongs to you. Hallelujah. And when God makes a promise, it don't matter if it's been 40 years. He said, I remember what my God told me. And when I walk on that hill, that hill's going to be mine in Jesus' name. That's the kind of attitude that we got to have, folks. Meshehele boshata. You are facing situations, and you are letting your situations put you on the run. And you need to turn around, and you need to say to that situation, I don't run from you. You run from me. My God told me that every place I set my foot belongs to me. And in Jesus' name, this situation is going to turn around. And it don't matter what it is. If it's financial, 
you speak a blessing over your life. Make sure you're tithing. My Lord, don't steal from God and wonder why you have financial trouble. But if it's financial, speak a blessing over your life. I am blessed and highly favored of the Lord. If it's health, Jesus has paid for my healing in the name of Jesus. My healing is bought and paid for. And all I've got to do is access it at the bank of heaven. And he gave me the account number. The account number is, by his stripes, I am healed in the name of Jesus. And he said, I am healed, and I am healed in Jesus' name. If your family members or your children are in rebellion, don't run from that. Don't despair. Look the devil in the eye and say, devil, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, they are serving God in Jesus. Oh, but they're out there ripping and running and drugging and doing this. I don't care. In Jesus' name, they will serve my God. Shut down now, now, Moshe. Hey. That's the kind of confidence that you have when you have intimacy with your God. Whoo! There you go. Anybody on the run? The devil got any of you on the run? You want to turn around and tell him, no, I ain't running no more. You're running. Come on. Come on to the front if you're struggling with something. I won't wait long. We don't even have instrumentalists. He's in the other room. I ain't going to worry about it. Mark can come up and strum. Come on up and strum, Mark, unless you need to pray. If you need to pray, you pray first. Everybody on the worship team knows that. Your intimacy with God comes first before this. Amen. Mm. Hallelujah. Anybody? Anybody struggling with something? Got you down. The devil's like had you on the run this week. It, whatever it is, we're not going to take long. I wanted to build the foundation today. Next week, I'm going to build the house. If I tried to build the foundation in the house, it, it would have been 1 o'clock. I didn't think you wanted that. But your God has paid for some things for you. Your God has done some things for you. He has opened the way for you to know him. And he wants to know you fully. Don't hide anything from your God. In Jesus' name. Now today, now today, we're going to turn around to the devil. And we're going to say, devil, I don't run from you. You run from me. In Jesus' name. I don't run, I don't run from you in my attitude. I don't run from you in my joy. I don't run from you in my peace. You run from me starting today. In Jesus' name. Because my God tells me every place I set my foot belongs to me. And I walk in the joy and the peace and the victory that my God has given me. Come on, say it with me right now. Say it with me right now, those of you that came forward. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, devil, you are defeated. You are defeated in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to come around and pray with each one of you. I want you to tell me what you're facing. We're going to, we're going to defeat.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's all stand together. Church, I am believing for astounding miracles this year. Astounding. God is already, I, I, he's already put in my heart things that he's going to do. And I'm not going to share them because they're, they're so outlandish that I just want to wait till God does it and then say, thank you, God. Make your focus this year knowing God as completely and fully as you can. And then watch what he does in your life. Amen? Amen. Do keep uh, Pastor and Sister Evelyn in prayer as they continue to travel for them to come back safely. And um, keep Stephanie in prayer uh, for touching her body. And also uh, keep uh, Renee, who's broken her shoulder or her collarbone or something. And uh, keep Karen in prayer. And anyone else in the church who needs a physical touch. Uh, Sister Carol and um, Ro Sister Rhonda, who sits in the back normally, she struggles. Keep everyone in the, in the church in prayer. Uh, we're going to walk in new confidence this week and next week, trust me. Uh, next week, the title of the message is, uh, it's the power of intimacy, but the title is, it's not what you know, it's who you know. So come back, and, uh, and, and we'll see what the Lord has to say next week. Amen? Let's be dismissed. Now let the words of our mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen and amen. God bless you. I love you. Thanks for coming out. Uh, bring someone back with you next week. Let's, let's double up. What do you say?